Hello, everyone. We are pleased to have you join us for Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Own the Histology Process. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Leica. Leica Microsystems is a world leader in microscopes and scientific instruments. For more information, please visit www.leicabiosystems.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner of the auditorium. This will direct you to the necessary site and form needed to receive your credits. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or Submit your problem through the green Q&A button, lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Andrew Visofsky, MS, HTL, ASCT. Andrew Visofsky is the Technical Application Manager at Leica Biosystems in Richmond, Illinois. Andrew has a master's degree in molecular biology from the Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. His current role with Leica Biosystems involves histology training and technical training for consumables in histology. He also works on the R&D team for quality and supports new product development. Andrew has authored publications including Gene Expression Analysis in Rats Treated with Experimental Acetyl-CoA Carboxylase Inhibitors Suggests Interactions with the PPAR Alpha Pathway, which was published in the Journal of Pharmacology and Exper Experimental Therapeutics in 2007. I will now turn it over to Andrew Lisowski for his presentation. Thank you, Rick. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to uh, another scientific webinar. Um, so today's talk is about the histology process. Um, and due to a um, really limited amount of time, which is um, 45 minutes to an hour, um, I hope you all understand that it's not possible to really discuss everything. So what I have done, um, I'm going to concentrate on the steps of the histology process um, how you can own it, how can you use your uh, uh, education, your science, your mind to use those solutions, the premium solutions, for the best optimal workflow undisrupted in the lab. So what are the goals in each and every histo lab? So, of course, the, uh, uh, choosing the right consumables um, is crucial for the optimal and undisrupted workflow. And we've all been there where you have chosen maybe economy blade or economy cut set just to learn that you have to repeat the whole process all over again just because you um, uh, didn't choose uh, wisely. So by doing so, you, um, you're trying to minimize um, uh, the risk of recurring work. And this is the big one. Um, with the big labs uh, are doing 5,000 or 500 uh, slides a day, you can't really step back for a block and, and do this work again. Um, so you, uh, we need you to use your knowledge and, 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 and just choose wisely and deliver the best results without uh, uh, repeating um, uh, your work. So we all know, um, let's start with challenging samples. So we all know the samples are, some of them are easy to work with and some of them are just horrible. Uh, and just an example of those uh, challenging samples are, uh, are tissues that you um, are process, you fix, you process, and you're trying to cut, and everything goes well until you stain them and they just come off the, uh, the glass. This is just the nature of some of the tissues like bone, cartilage, retina, it's just a nightmare to cut, as uh, all those folks that uh, work on the ophthalmic uh, research places. Fetid issues, that's always a challenging, breasts like breast biopsy for brain, um, skin is not easy to cut and deal with, um, or tissues that uh, require special processing. There's lots of them, um, or samples that are cut at different thicknesses. Um, and of course, the whole world of the research where uh, folks are dealing with marine, avian, or reptile specimen. This is a completely different uh, world uh, for them. But you have to understand this is one histology, and all we all try to retain that uh, precious sample on the slide. 
Um, so these are the cha challenging samples that we all are aware of. Then you have challenging applications, and there are multiple of them, like histo uh, immunohistochemistry. So whoever done, uh, whoever is doing immunohistochemistry, you know that the tissue will be most likely exposed to high temperatures. Um, there will be repeated washes uh, with different buffers. Um, some of those will be, some of those uh, uh, samples will be exposed to harsh techniques, uh, um, like antigen retrieval techniques, where you uh, either use buffers with a high pH or extreme temperatures ranging to all the way to 120 Celsius. So this is, uh, this is something that uh, uh, people are aware of. These are challenging applications. And another one, um, a good one, is an in situ hybridization, whether this is a colorimetric, uh, radioactive, or just fluorescent. You also expose your uh, samples to the high temperatures. You uh, introduce this, those stringency washes um, for hours and hours in salty buffers. So these are conditions that will try to do everything to make your uh, sample uh, uh, disappear or be lost. Frozen sectioning. This is a challenging application, also not easy. Um, you're dealing with a non-fixed tissue, which is also like or is prone to come off the slides. Or a tissue, very often, um, it is cut not at your routine four to five or six microns. These are the tissues that many folks would cut at 20 microns and try to retain uh, a tissue uh, death take on the glass. So you need to know how to do it, what to use, which slide to pick, how, what technique to use, to help yourself to retain that sample on the glass. And of course, there are many different special stains that would employ heat or just plain, simple, uh, abrasive chemicals. They are nasty and also not very friendly, but you have to use them. And, and so your goal is to use your knowledge um, to combat those uh, uh, applications, those, those uh, conditions. Um, so, so basically, you're trying to prevent uh, uh, tissue under, that is under fixed, um, tissue that is, uh, uh, that would be a poor process, or tissue that is, uh, you're trying to avoid uh, uh, tissue sections missing or partially missing or folding over. And of course, you're trying to achieve optimal staining, a big one uh, with no background, just beautiful H&E, if it's an H&E uh, stain, and avoid maybe a, something like eosin leaching um, that would just change everything. So these are just few examples. I hope you understand. It's not possible to talk all about the uh, uh, best things that can happen to your sample. These are just basic ones. So what I have done, I uh, created a histology workflow, and this is just a routine workflow. And so if you look at that chart, if you follow the arrow, everything starts from trimming. You have to fix your tissue. You process your tissue, and then you embed. So then sec you section the tissue, stain, cover, slip, and you can just take your slide to a pathologist or you can read it yourself, and then some people would just digitize uh, the slides um, into a, a hard drive, and then the lastly, you would just store the slide. So this is a long process, as you know. Um, some hospitals would spend a day, too, if it's a small biopsy sample that could be maybe a day, but there are uh, techniques like um, radioactive in situ that would uh, require two um, different developments from the film, and this very same flow will take two months. So it depends who you are, where you work, uh, but the basic stuff, those are the steps that are uh, 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 same for uh, uh, the routine histology workflow. So, if you, so, so that was the uh, 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 simplify. If you look at the um, uh, enhanced workflow, we all know that when you deal with the bony tissue, you need to employ another step. You need to decalcify the tissue. We'll talk about it for a few minutes. Um, when you're dealing with the frozen techniques, you bypass a few steps, but then this is um, something um, that um, allows you to cut time and um, provide the answer to a pathologist much faster, but that's yet another technique. You embed it differently, you cut it on a different uh, uh, equipment, and, and there's no fixation. And of course, if you look at the section staining, so this is not just routine H&E. You have a variety of uh, choices. Um, it's up to a pathologist, I guess, to um, ask you to do immunohistochemistry or follow the in situ or even a special stains that are more and more popular. And of course, in the middle, you can, uh, you can do um, laser microdissection, but you still need to go through all those basic steps that would lead uh, uh, to a section um, uh, 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 being put on the uh, glass slide. 
So let's talk about the um, few steps. Um, um, so the first one is that I have chosen uh, is decalcification. Um, and you, if you think about decalcification, this is where uh, people would uh, make several mistakes. And um, so um, hopefully everybody is aware that um, you, can, you can choose um, uh, different assets, different decalcifying agents. So um, the thing is you have to be smart about it. You have to know whether to choose strong or a weak acid whether your sample will be um, uh, are used to do immunohistochemistry. If this is the case, um, you, need, uh, uh, you, need to be, uh, you need to choose uh, a different decalcifying agent. So, so size and density of the sample matters for, uh, uh, for you. I mean, you have to uh, know that the strong acid will work very fast. Uh, however, you can easily over decalcify the sample and you, that sample could be lost forever. So you have to be aware of it. Aware of it. Um, same with the weak um, acid. When you choose to uh, um, um, work with the weak acid, um, the process is much, much slower. Um, so uh, very often um, the manufacturer will combine um, this weak acid with the formaldehyde. So while you are decalcifying the tissue, that very sample is being fixed at the same time. So it's very useful. Not surprisingly, not very many people know there are different acids. Um, and um, if you uh, work, uh, if, you, if your goal is uh, immunohistochemistry, um, you have to be aware you cannot use anything acid-based. It most likely would have to be something with the EDTA. A dilution 14% EDTA would, would work wonderfully. The acids would just simply uh, destroy uh, epitopes or antigens uh, sitting on those epitopes. So. Um, if you're dealing with some abundant uh, protein, you might get away. And, um, but of course, you have to be aware of it. You have to uh, do multiple rounds to make sure which acid, which decalcifying agent is uh, a correct one. Um, and of course, time uh, allowed for decalcification. That needs to be established and validated uh, by the institution that you work for. Um, the excessive decalcification, decalcification, decalcification time is often uh, seen when people tend to forget that they have something in a jar under the hood and you come back and the tissue is lost because uh, there would be no morphology. You can't really uh, uh, see anything. Everything's just uh, chewed up. Um, also, if you, work, uh, if you are working with a bigger sample or uh, something very dense, and your um, agent, your decalcifying agent, might be um, just too weak, and it just takes forever uh, uh, to decalcify. So um, wrong or not optimal uh, decalcifying would lead to uh, uh, repeating uh, this procedure until you get it right. So you have to get it right the first time, and so I need you to be aware there are different decalcifying agents, different strengths, and um, depends on the technique, whether this is immuno or routine, um, this is up to you which uh, one you choose, but uh, we need you to choose uh, wisely. So that's an example of um, how things can go wrong um, in the lab. Uh, <clears throat> so another step um, would be processing. Um, so the processing is a, um, um, is a step that usually um, our people do overnight uh, if it's a just routine sample. Um, so the first thing is to uh, uh, a correct choice of reagents, um, and we need uh, we need to know that um, those reagents, first of all, they need to be replaced or rotated strictly according to established guidelines. So there is no cut, cutting corners here. And um, some people I've seen that would use um, ethyl alcohol, pure ethyl alcohol, as a reagent, and while this is that would be good for some tissues. Most of the time, that's just too harsh. And it's maybe not necessary. Uh, uh, using of uh, a reagent alcohol that is simply mixed um, as an additive of uh, methanol and isopropanol uh, would do the work. Um, it's inexpensive, and it's also there's no BAT, BATF license needed. So you can, uh, uh, you can use reagent alcohol. You should maybe uh, consider uh, using reagent alcohol to just cut costs. Um, the paraffins, this is a big one, um, and there's a lot of, lot of talk on forums, histoforums, which paraffin to use. Um, so it's up to the lab. Um, so there are three different kinds of paraffins. So you have paraffins designed or designed to work, um, to do the job the best while uh, 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 doing the processing. 
there are two steps processor or uh, paraffins that are used for both processing and embedding, and there are just paraffins designed uh, for uh, better embedding. So let's just talk about for two minutes about the uh, infiltration paraffin. So um, if you're dealing with the uh, uh, tissue that is uh, bigger or denser, your wise choice would be to uh, research a, a paraffin that would contain DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. This is a still a, a very small, tiny molecule that helps carry a long chain, carbohydrate chain of uh, uh, wax into the tissue. So your infiltration happens faster. Um, there's less, uh, 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 less chances of uh, tissue being under processed. So once um, uh, you um, try that, um, and I talk to many people over the phone, they just love it, and they, they would have uh, a big samples, dense tissues, and they would just work wonderfully. So just bear in mind that uh, 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 if you use, if you want a premium optimal paraffin for that step, your paraffin should or maybe ought to uh, contain that additive of DMSO. Um, another um, um, a thing that people uh, um, tend to uh, not pay attention is using the right cassette. So there are so many cassettes out there. And so I think that the biggest is using the right pore size, uh, which is very important because the size of the pore is important for the fluid exchange. And we know during the processing you have alcohol, xylenes, paraffins, the bigger the pole, the better fluid exchange, the better processing. So you will not deal with the underprocessed tissue. There are cassettes um, that would help you with your uh, with your life in the lab that would have slope walls, and so or no corners at all. So when you're dealing with the small, tiny biopsy of uh, pieces, um, it's easier for you to remove those uh, samples from the cassette. Um, um, with, 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 with pointy uh, um, forceps. There are cassettes um, designated for the biopsies uh, with the mesh, they, uh, they have the mesh or screen. So uh, they've been used by people that work with the biopsies a lot and um, um, they, like, they, they like them a lot. So also the choice of the cassette. So if your lab is using a printer, you have to remember, oops, I think I fast forward, Sorry about that. So, the, uh, so remember to use uh, or to choose the cassette that is optimized for printing. So the surface of the cassette is um, has the correct writing angle, which is very important. Um, and um, you might not be aware, but different manufacturers would uh, use um, different designs. So some of those surfaces are at the 45 or 35 or even 50 degree angle. So if you use a cassette just because you like the price or the color on your printer, you might not have the optimal uh, uh, ink uh, uh, placed on the surface because there's just the angle is uh, wrong. So either you can adjust the angle, some printers you can do it, some you can't, or you can just choose the best cassette that would uh, have the right angle and a perfect surface that was validated to receive that ink. Um, and of course, for speed, um, um, newest last maybe few years, uh, companies would uh, sell the cassette that are very nicely, conveniently packed uh, in tubes, or they would be called sometimes stacked uh, or uh, uh, taped, I guess. So if uh, you really want to cut time uh, during the printing cassettes, you would buy those cassettes, load them on the cassette with just within two seconds. You have 60 or 80 cassettes in the tube, and you can print them very easily. And of course, security, uh, this is the big one. If you lose a sample, you know, um, this, is, this is a bad, this is, I think, the baddest thing that can happen in the lab. You lose a sample just because you chose a inferior cassette with a badly designed hinge, and, um, and it's a tragedy because you, um, you, how do you tell the patient, hey, we need you to come back to a hospital for another biopsy because you lose, we lose your sample. So this is something that cannot happen. You have to make sure that your cassettes are the best of the best. And of course, um, the technique, the processing time um, itself. I mean, I was at the uh, couple of years at NSH and I saw a booklet that, uh, um, uh, that would be dedicated to processing times. Um, that booklet has 45 pages on different times, guidelines for different uh, samples. So um, you have general uh, 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 processing, 
uh, routine small and large animals or biopsy skin. Then you have the times for specialized uh, uh, tissues like bone, bones or dental samples, or even special uh, uh, tissues like marine or reptiles people do process corals, and that's completely different time. So all the times you have to be aware, and most of you are, um, those times differ from sample to sample. So you have to be uh, uh, aware of it. And so when you do a poor job, when you do not use your best paraffin, what happens? I mean, that paraffin, that sample, most likely will become brittle or impossible to cut. You have to go back. If you're lucky enough to have another sample, you can redo it again. But what do you do with a sample that is poorly processed? The basic the sample is lost. So it's very bad. Um, also with the cassette, when the cassette, when the ink, uh, you choose a wrong cassette or uh, inferior quality cassette, and the ink on the surface of the cassette being uh, is dissolved due to heat or the reagents on the processor. I mean, don't forget that cassettes are exposed to uh, um, harsh reagents, I mean, alcohol, xylene, um, uh, 60 degrees Celsius of paraffin, that's not very friendly for the ink. So if you lose that, just because the ink doesn't sit well on the surface of the plastic cassette, that's really bad, because you can't really tell whose sample is it, and that's the last thing you uh, want it to happen in the lab. Um, so the next step um, is embedding. Um, so embedding, trying to fast forward, there you go. So embedding, um, first technique. Um, so uh, you need to, uh, of course, use your best techniques. Orientation, you need to be aware of the right orientation, whether you uh, embed a calcified long piece of tissue or a skin sample, you need to know how to do it. Um, you, uh, you might want to use the correct molds. Uh, and by saying correct molds, the molds that would help your life. There are molds out there that uh, will uh, limit your time while scraping the block because it's, they really, really are forgiving in terms of overflowing. So you might want to know that. And of course, avoid excessive heat, um, like temperature of the embedding center that would uh, 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 ruin your samples. Um, and choosing the right optimal embedding media, that's the big one. That's the paraffin that you would like to uh, uh, use would contain uh, a polymer or a contain a dye to make your life much easier. So polymers, what they do, um, companies like us are, uh, would add polymers, not even one, but combination of different polymers, different sizes, just to make that embedding media a little harder. So when that uh, paraffin solidifies, it's harder, therefore it's easier to cut. So if you're dealing with a place um, that does biopsies at two microns. Um, honest to God, your choice should be and ought to be uh, an, uh, embedding with the polymer and loaded with it actually, so your life is so easy. You cut flawless sections, there's no compression. So also by adding polymer, you can play with the melting temperature time um, uh, point. So those uh, polymer containing media, they usually have elevated uh, uh, melting point uh, 58, 60 degrees, which is good. You, this is what you want while you cut the section. This is not the media you want to use while infiltrating the tissue. This is the media you want to use when making your beautiful blocks. Um, there are paraffins out there that would contain dye, and one might say, why would you want to dye in a polymer, uh, in the media, in the paraffin, I'm sorry. So whenever you're dealing with the opaque tissue or white tissue, uh, and you're dealing with the liquid, so, uh, uh, a clear paraffin, it's sometimes very hard to see, if not impossible, if you're dealing with a small, tiny biopsy. If you use a um, slightly um, uh, tinted paraffin, let's say with the blue or red color, whatever it is, you see that sample right away. So you cut time while embedding. You are more comfortable. Um, there's less chances of uh, using the tissue. You will not be uh, 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 disappointed while using it. It's really, really uh, friendly that contrast that the paraffin will give you between a clear liquid, clear paraffin, and a, and a white opaque tissue. Um, and of course, the worst when you lose a sample because you just can't see it. Uh, I've done it myself. I was dealing with some uh, neonatal ovaries at some point, and I just chose that way. Um, I, will, uh, I didn't have money at that time for that, or the institution didn't have money for that. 
I just lost a couple of the uh, uh, samples. That was the bad thing that happened to me. I learned hard way. Now, whenever I'm dealing with this small tissue like that, um, I would use the paraffin that would just help me uh, to do the job uh, better. Um, so that's embedding um, part. So um, the next step uh, would be sectioning. Um, so sectioning, um, so this is where basically two things happen. So you need a right blade and you need a right glass. This is a big one. So the art of sectioning really, because this is really an art, uh, using the right blade, blade is really a science. People think, well, it's just a sharp blade. Uh, what's the difference, you know? So you need to remember um, that the blades are made differently. They are uh, economy blades or the, the best blade. Some blades you can cut 10 sections with. Some blades will last much longer. And then depends how the blade is made. So be aware, of course, there are high profiles and low profile blades. A high profile, since they have a little more steel, think about it, when you cut, when you use them on a, a dense tissue, on bony tissue, they will vibrate less. You don't see the vibration, but the tissue will feel it. So using high profile blade, if you're using hard tissues, might help you. The blade design, uh, whether this is double, triple facet, uh, the, 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 the blade angle, which could be 35 or even 22 uh, degrees, that can help you to uh, 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 achieve um, uh, your sections way better, way faster. They'll be just better looking sections. Um, and of course, coating, this is, uh, this is a big one. Everybody does it differently, but you really have to be educated about your choices, you know, uh, depending what are you cutting the most often. And this is, this is what, that, 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 that's the choice you have to make. You have to be educated about the blades. So the blades, uh, when you use a bl good blade, um, there's no chance of going back and doing many recuts uh, due to poor quality of the blade or tissue folding over. Uh, and the, another uh, uh, a big one is the, uh, I think this is the, actually the biggest here in that chart, um, choosing the right glass light for your tissue type and staining application. So first of all, um, if it's a staining application, like immunohistochemistry or inside, do you know right off the bat that you would need help to retain that tissue on the glass slide? So you most likely, you would want to have a coated slide. Um, if it's a tissue that is cut at um, thicker um, thickness, also your choice would be, hey, I need help, I need a slide that is coated. And of course, companies uh, would use different coatings um, different method, methods, how you know, uh, application methods, how to put that coating on the surface. So, um, so coated slides would promote tissue adhesion. And also, I don't know if you know, but um, the slides are um, not all alike. There are slides um, are made from white glass or uh, uh, green glass. So, green glass would be your economy glass, and white glass would be your premium glass, and for example, if you work, and you would say, what's the difference, really? I'm doing just routine histology. Well, in that case, maybe it wouldn't be a difference. But if you're doing once in a while, or if you do a fluorescent in situ, um, you might want to stick with the white glass, uh, the premium glass, because the green glass has a higher content of iron that can immunofluorescent under the dark field. So you might have false, res false positive results. So you want to avoid that. So bear in mind, white glass versus green, green glass. Also, the way the slides are coated uh, or the compound. Um, so there are companies that are use amino acids, uh, compounds that are using uh, um, proteins or polymers. This is the uh, uh, um, latest techniques. So uh, the premium slides, differently coated. Uh, and also the method is very important. So depending how you coat your slides, you would achieve different properties. Um, of course, you can um, dilute the amino acid or protein or polymer differently, and therefore you will achieve different uh, properties of the slide. So no, not all the coded slides are alike, just bear in mind. So, and also the big one, people say, hey, what is the really a hydrophobic and hydrophilic slide? What, what, what is this all about? So all the coded slides are hydrophobic. Um, just by adding this adhesive, whether this is amino acid or a polymer, that stuff repels water. So repels water, it's just a hydrophobic, water-hating surface. 
And this is what you this is what you want for the heart um, to or uh, easy to lose tissue. Uh, hydrophilic slides are still hydrophobic. I know it's confusing. So hydrophilic slides has hydrophilic properties because your um, slides will promote greater homogeneous spread of the applied solution, and you can uh, use it to your advantage. For example, if you're working on immunohistochemistry and you have your precious antibody or precious um, secondary, whatever it is, you will use, you might want to use less of solutions because that solution will occupy a bigger area thanks to hydrophilic properties of the hydrophobic slide. So, so coating does matter. Of course, uh, clip corner slides, uh, regular slides or clip corner slides, other slides to um, help you uh, with the speed. Um, so, so when you use your printer, um, those clip corners work very well because there's less chance to, for the glass breakage, for glass fragmentation. So there's no jamming. Um, you can do your uh, work much faster. Um, of course, the uh, specialized slides like bevel slides, you know, they're great for the uh, blacksmiths. We all know that, but because they bevel when you drag the slide against the slide, you, um, the, the friction is much re reduced, so there's no glass powder or glass dust on the slide that receives the uh, uh, blood smear. Um, there are slides, I don't know if you're aware, they are um, coded specifically uh, for the uh, thermal printers. Uh, so that's a big one too. Um, if you have a thermal printer, you might want to check which slide is the best uh, for my uh, printer. Um, and of, um, there are slides that will help you with, uh, to work with your special stains. Um, the slides will have uh, a line that divides the field into two, um, and it just allows you to put a control, positive control tissue on the very same slide. So when you go back, you have your negative, you have unknown, and your positive on one slide. So it just makes your life much easier, more streamlined. Um, and uh, two words on the water bath adhesive uh, additives. Those people who choose to um, add their own additives to the water bath to coat the slides while picking up the tissue, this is a great method as well, but you have to remember that you cannot add too much to the water bath. You cannot overdo it. And of course, you cannot use the coated slides and coat them again in the water bath. Um, I was reading the um, scientific uh, publication, and they were actually uh, uh, looking at the layers of the coating on the glass slide, and ideally that coating should be between three to seven layers. So if you overdo it and create 20 layers, you think, okay, I'm going to coat that a little more. It'll be better adhesive. Well, it's not. You, you're doing uh, yourself a disfavor because that tissue that sits on top is just being too unstable, and chances are you will lose it during the subsequent uh, staining. So um, so we have your our slides, um, and we need to stain them. So um, staining, again, there are so many different death methods, your routine H&E, and of course, specialized staining, immuno, and situ, uh, uh, and, 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 and special stain. So first of all, you need to achieve perfect coloration. How, you, how do you do it, really? Uh, so each step, um, in the staining process has to be accurately timed. So there's no cutting corners here as well. And it, but it's up to you which stain do you use. Is it stain done by the company that makes it, or is it someone that sells it to you and they really don't know the chemistry behind it? So I really like when I was uh, working in the lab with different stains, I really like a, a, a place that I would call and ask questions, you know, how is the, what is the pH? Uh, what happens if the, uh, I mix this uh, component with that component. So this is up to you, but you have to go with the best because that stain uh, is how the pathologist will uh, uh, make a decision. Um, so choosing the progressive versus regressive method, uh, choosing uh, the right choice of hematoxin, uh, differentiator, a big one. So if it's a... Uh, um, a hydrochloric acid base uh, a differentiator. Um, you might want to consider uh, another one that has a organic acid that is gentler on your slides, uh, gentler on the bond that is uh, being formed between a uh, glass and a tissue, um, and also um, weaker, weaker differentiators um, 
they would clear goblet cells uh, with the mucin in it. Some people don't just like that dark image of the mucin on the goblet cells that kind of distracts from the nuclei staining. So I'm just telling you there are different, not all the differentiators are the same, like many, many different hematoxins. And I'm looking at my clock, it's 1040, so I need to um, go a little faster here. So xylene and xylene free staining, a big one lately. Uh, we all want to be, uh, uh, environment uh, are friendly, so there are a lot of push to uh, substitute xylene. But the xylene-free product, you have to remember you need to make necessary adjustments for that. So whenever you're using xylene-free uh, 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 clearance, the time needs to be increased. You need to rotate, sometimes twice, you need to rotate or change that uh, uh, product uh, to avoid eosin leaching because that water that gets to the uh, xylene-free uh, um, clearance really has a great affinity to eosin. So eosin is, uh, uh, so the water is pulling eosin from the slides. So you have to remember there are, you, this is just not a simple substitution. You have to be aware um, that using xylene-free um, reagents, you need to increase time. Um, and of course, going back to the slides, um, when you choose your slides with the amino acids, um, um, they are covered with amino acids, Bear in mind that your uh, section might give you a little bit of a blue background. This is well-known phenomena. Uh, uh, maybe if you if you go with the polymer coated, you might uh, uh, improve your uh, appearance of the slide. Um, so lastly, um, the last thing. So you have your stain, beautiful stain. You have to protect the stain. You protect the stain with a cover slipping step. So cover slip step. Also, people do not pay attention to. Uh, to this fact that you can really uh, ruin your slide here. Let me advance the slide here a little bit. There you go. So first of all, is it automated or is it a manual? You have to remember about the proper cover, cover slip settings. People completely uh, forget about that, that there are different nozzle gauges on those cover slippers. So depending which uh, mounting media you use, they do have different viscosity. So that volume needs to be adjusted, bigger nozzle, smaller nozzle media drop positioning, you need to be, but this is done, that could be uh, done over the phone by an uh, um, engineer, or you can do it yourself, just be aware that too much, too little can really uh, 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 make your life harder because you need to go back and re-soak the slides, a long process, as you know, to recover slip the slides. Um, so the cover glass for the automated process, this is, um, this is the cover slip that is um, actually designated for the automated process where the extra step is added during the manufacturing process to prevent sticking. So you might want to consider, you probably seen cover, uh, cover glass or machine trying to pick up a single cover glass and unfortunately due to the humidity or poor quality of the cover glass, then machine would pick two and the machine jam just stops because it, 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 it senses it's got more than one individual cover slip. So the choice of cover glass is important. You don't want the uh, uh, glass slide just hanging in the uh, machine waiting to be cover slip, drying, and so just slowing the process, interrupting the workflow. Um, and the proper selection of Monday media, lastly, you know, the com compatibility between aromatic and aliphatic, which is basically uh, xylene and xylene um, substitute products. You need to be aware. To, you need to be aware that you need to be cho choose wisely. When you, uh, if you're using uh, xylene substitutes as a last station in your stainer, you really need a xylene um, bouncing media that is based on the very same uh, uh, clearance. Uh, BHT um, stands for butyl hydroxytoluene. Uh, hydroxytoluene. This is just an anti-fading agent. Um, people would go back uh, years later to some old cases, try to review, and guess what? stain is completely faded. And if you use a mounting media that doesn't have it, that might happen. So make sure that the mounting media would um, uh, contain that antioxidant, anti-fading agent. So these all are steps that can really uh, help you um, in the lab. So just be aware of those, of those challenges. And, uh, and, and if you are, uh, the more you're educated, the better your choices are. Um, you need to be aware of your choices out there in the market so you can minimize um, repeating your work or going back and do it all over again. You can decrease easily. You can decrease time and laboratory costs by not repeating stuff, by using
sometimes maybe more a little bit more expensive product, but you know it'll work every single time. So you are optimizing your workflow. And all that reads basically to improving performance in patient care where you can give a beautiful slide to a pathologist um, in the shortest possible time. I guess that was my um, last slide, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you understand in such a short time I couldn't possibly touch on everything. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that informative presentation. I'm thrilled to be part of Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Let's see. It, it looks at this point we don't have any questions for Andrew, but we encourage you to head over to the community of learning following this presentation to engage in a live chat with Andrew and your peers and continue the discussion regarding the histology process. I would like to thank our sponsor, Leica, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please, please again, make sure to visit the community of learning uh, to speak with Andrew Lisowski and, and discuss the histology process. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of this year. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.